But I just uh, wanted to say that uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit daunting for me to stand here. I'm looking into the audience and there's people here who are sort of running cattle before I was even born. And so it's always a, it's a bit uh, concerning when you're a young whippersnapper like me sort of gets up to talk about the northern cattle industry. But I'm going to have a go at it anyway. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, not probably have too many graphs and statistics. We've had some good statistics from Trish. Um, but I'm going to talk about, I guess, our supply chain and our, our production system and how we integrate with Southeast Asia um, and how we integrate with the rest of the country. And probably also I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our industry representation, uh, our, some of our bodies that actually sort of guide what we do as well. So I'll slip into it. Um, that's the Barclay Tableland um, at an angle. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Somebody um, who was working on a, on a place on Brunette Down said they used to listen to a lot of the tourists drive past and, and they'd be all talking to each other on, the, on their radios and apparently uh, one day this, one of the tourists said, oh, isn't it terrible how they cleared all the land out and you know, knocked all the trees over. Lo and behold, it was like that from the, the beginning. Just, just a really quick sort of thumbnail on, on the NT industry. Um, it's an industry that currently runs about 2.1 million head of cattle, or about 7% of the herd, and it turns off about 600,000 head of cattle a year. Um, and I'll show you later where most of those go. Um, but, but largely, in general terms, every year about half of them go to live export. Um, and in, in terms of an industry, it's actually very small from the point of view of how many people are involved. Um, because the property sizes are quite large, average size is about 3,000 square kilometres. The average herd is something like 8,000 head. So as an industry, we're sort of a very small group. It's quite a small family in the Northern Territory. And as a peak body, it's, it's easy to have a, a very consistent view from your membership about where we should go because we're one commodity. We don't seem to argue too much. Touch wood. Um, and in, in land area terms, it manages about half of the Northern Territory's land mass, um, which is about 600,000 square kilometres. Um, just very quickly about the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association. It's, a, it's, a, it's the peak body for the industry. It holds about 90% of the herd. Um, its membership, its members in, include the large corporates, some of which have operations outside of the Territory in Western Australia and Queensland. Um, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal pastoral lessees, uh, freehold properties, a um, number of sort of corporations. So we're, we're a, we have a very broad, diverse group of members. Um, down to the family run operations. We run a structure which is at four branches and we have an executive committee which is formed um, completely voluntarily. Uh, people are unpaid. There's not many paid people in the organisation uh, and we have reps on Cattle Council and National Farmers Federation. And look, if we're into statistics, I know statistics are interesting. We've got 12 staff and, and half, of those are, half of those staff are uh, Indigenous. Um, and we run a number of range of initiatives including uh, Indigenous employment initiatives across the Territory which engage about 60 young people annually uh, on pastoral properties, major, mainly with the large corporate operations. Um, and we also engage in activities that are about developing people-to-people -people links in Indonesia particularly, which we see as very important. And now on to the detail. Um, if we look at the Northern Territory, um, the thing we notice is that from a land tenure perspective, this is the, predominantly the cattle growing regions. This is Aboriginal land, um, and that mixes around 50-50. And most of the cattle are run on that, on those, in those regions there. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that the production system is pretty simple. Um, rain, carbon dioxide, um, sunlight, um, and, and meat. And it's, the, it's a carbon sink, it walks around. But I think a lot of us seem to forget that carbon dioxide is a pretty important driver in the whole system. But that's the production system, it's a pretty simple model. Um, and largely the, the output from the territory goes uh, south, so we've got a lot of cattle coming out of Central Australia into the eastern states um, and live export. Of that 600,000, that's roughly the mix. Um, and at the moment, there are only four abattoirs which are only catered to domestic consumption, and they'd probably be lucky to kill 100 head of cattle a week in the Territory. And they're located, um, three of those are on sort of Aboriginal, Aboriginal uh, land trusts, and one isn't just out of Alice Springs. So it's a pretty simple, simple formula. It's a, it's a mass exodus every year. Everything leaves the territory. It's just a big calf factory. Uh, everything leaves, leaves the territory and goes somewhere else for value adding or fattening elsewhere uh, or fattening in Indonesia. Um, and all our business inputs come in. There's a bit of bitumen from, from the south, south, southern part of Australia. We've got a bitumen road in from the east, one from the western Australia, and the rest of it comes in through other means. So it's a, um, it's a fairly landlocked difficult place to get in and out of, particularly during the wet season with the road conditions and the infrastructure that we have in the north. So what does the industry look like? Um, I guess we see our, our 
greatest asset of the people, um, and we think mobilising those people and getting a smart, uh, a smart workforce, a smart um, business sector is the key to the future. Um, and uh, clearly that we've got new generations of people coming through who, are, who hopefully do see a future in the industry um, as we go forward. But it's cat categorised um, in the Northern Territory is probably, I think it has the highest level of foreign ownership and historically that's been the case. And it's categorised by very much the whole spectrum of operations, like the very big and the very small. Uh, we have a, a large number of corporate operations in the Northern Territory which also have their operations elsewhere across Northern Australia. Um, but it's everything from small, single, single people operations, family farms, up to the corporates, uh, and there's still quite a lot of foreign ownership um, as part of that formula. Um, and it's, it's, it's a country and a, and, a, and a landscape that also has its challenges with pests and, and diseases, um, or particularly pests, weeds, feral animals, camels, horses, donkeys. Um, some of the weeds that we have in Northern Australia are creating some pretty major challenges. Um, for, for utilisation of the land. Very important fact, however, is that 99% of the territory is native vegetation. Um, fly, flew in here yesterday, or the day before yesterday, flew into Canberra, it looked like the top end. Uh, green grass, lots of water, um, but a pretty altered landscape. The Northern Territory is 99% uh, native vegetation. 1% of the territory has been developed for agricultural or urban development. So we are fundamentally dealing with a natural production system on native pastures, and that is, that's the Barclay Tableland, but equally um, other parts of the Territory are very much more like timbered sort of landscape savannah. So it's a very natural production system predominantly, and that in itself creates a number of challenges for producers in the Territory, and I'll explain further on in relation to how that interfaces with, in this case, Southeast Asia, and also feeding and fattening operations outside of the Territory. Um, and it's an industry that's had to adapt and adapt quite rapidly sort of pre and post VTEC. Um, and we're seeing the, the replacement of labour. It's had happened a long time ago with capital. Uh, so we're seeing an industry that has had to, had to uh, improve and increase its efficiency as time has gone by. And, uh, and that's had a, a number of consequences. That process is still going on. Um, we've also seen the Territory has been one of those areas where the, the land rights movement got going very early in the piece and the, the uh, wave of walk off was something that started that process. But in a time when Aboriginal labour was, was the predominant source of labour till today, uh, where Aboriginal labour is a very small proportion of the industry's um, output. And there's certain things going on which are about trying to increase that level of engagement um, with the Indigenous population, which at this point in time is 30% is of the, sort of the northern demographic and increasing very rapidly. Um, and it, in, in 20 odd years, they believe it'll be about 50% of the, the population across the north. So systems to engage the Indigenous community across Northern Australia is a part of the pastoral industry's focus. Um, but the system itself, uh, given that it's using natural pastures across the board largely, um, it, it, there's a, very, a range of combinations which use northern floodplains to, to feed the live export industry. Um, and that's, I'm just going to show you a few pictures of the production system. And for many who know the industry better than I, these are, there's, no, there's no surprise in this. But the industry still combines the old and the new, new technology around low stress stock handling and um, modern production systems, um, the use of helicopters and, and, and heavy equipment to get the job done efficiently and fast, and in many cases to replace labour. So there's a very strong mixture of the old and the new, and, and, and uh, quiet, well-adjusted livestock is very much part of that equation. I, um, this is a lot of Barclay Tableland pictures, but these are just familiar pictures which give you an idea of the scale um, of the production systems through the north um, and the use of fairly expensive equipment to uh, move livestock and, and plant. Ultimately, if I, I come down to, the, I guess, the, the focus of particularly the northern live export zone, it's predominantly on the Southeast Asian um, market and Darwin and Wyndham and, and uh, those northern ports are the, are the avenue for those cattle to go out. Um, I think this is where we, last year we were very much tested in relation to our engagement with Southeast Asia. Um, I think we all got a bit of a shock when the bomb went off last year after Four Corners. Um, but the fundamental system that the northern part of the Territory particularly works on is their capacity to breed cattle cheaply and efficiently, move them to Southeast Asia, in this case Indonesia, where there's cheap feed feedstuffs, uh, cheap labour, and go through the fattening process. We, f we breed, they feed. It's a beautifully symbiotic sort of a relationship, uh, which is a very legitimate. Um, it makes a lot of sense. It adds value at our end, it adds value at the Indonesian end. 
one of the challenges in Northern Australia at the moment, and it all has historically been a challenge, and uh, John may touch on it, um, Trish also touched on it, is that predominantly to get cattle to a weight that is suitable to be slaughtered um, generally takes a lot more than two years. So you, you're pushing cattle into the, I guess, the man manufacturing grade for beef. And it's a function of genetics, it's a function of uh, land type, nutrition, um, and also the northern production systems, which are quite, are quite uh, um, challenging to get those weight gains. So effectively, it's that the industry in the north is producing, in sheep terms, mutton um, or cow beef, and that in itself is it will always be, uh, I guess, a, a barrier to northern, to northern processing, along with some of the other issues that the previous speaker raised. So Indonesia provides that, that wonderful opportunity for northern cattle to go into the feedlot system. Um, and the transformation of those cattle up in Indonesia is quite out, outstanding. Uh, cheap feed, uh, high quality feed, uh, cheap labour, um, and a very efficient feedlot sector uh, really, really do it well. Um, Indonesia has a, you know, a population of 240 million. Uh, there's no welfare system. There's, um, I think it's about 8% unemployment rate. Uh, and 20% of people still earn less than $1.20 a day. So the, the feedlot systems in Indonesia are an integral part of their, their economic development, employment, income generation. Uh, and that's why last year, I think, when, 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 when things, things, the bomb went off, uh, it created not only a ripple effect in Australia, but it created a ripple effect through, through Indonesia. And it also made people suddenly question issues around food security and that supply of beef. Now there's, there's certain, uh, the, the agriculture minister in Indonesia talks about self-sufficiency and, and in some, in some contexts they talk about our cattle being part of that self-sufficiency model whereby smaller, younger cattle are fed lot in Indonesia, gain, gain value for the Indonesians and are part of their self-sufficiency model. That story sometimes changes. Um, but I guess this, this is an important industry for Indonesia, it's an important industry for us. Um, and we also see a certain amount of um, market differentiation in Indonesia where you've got not only the wet market systems but also uh, beef that's going into supermarkets, um, hotels and, and restaurants and all the rest of it. But most of that beef would come out of this part of the world um, at the higher end of the value chain. Um, 